I'm Duncan Foley. I, I think I know almost everybody here. Um, and uh, I've been uh, doing a talk, uh, something like this, pretty much every year for the past few years. Um, the idea of it is to try to collect together some general information about, uh, especially about thesis writing, but in a broader sense, as you'll see, the way I think about it, about research uh, and career issues uh, as they impinge on graduate students um, in one in one kind of package, just to get these ideas in, in your mind. Um, and I usually find the most helpful way to do this is um, to have quite a bit of time <coughs> for specific questions. So what I'll try to do is keep my remarks down to um, about 45 minutes or so so that we have plenty of time uh, to go into anything that people want to in more depth as, as far as I can. <coughs> but I wouldn't um, feel um, inhibited if I say something during the 45 minutes that you really feel you want to comment on or expand on <coughs> to raise the um, to raise an issue in the middle. Because <coughs> it's very informal. Um, so I thought about how to organize this a little bit, and I think the logical way to organize it is for me to um, speak uh, a little bit about the broad background of thesis research um, and the issue of what's an original contribution and the history of uh, the PhD um, and the conception of the PhD, which are things that many people, maybe some of you know, but I think some people don't know. Particularly, I think these are issues that uh, uh, are uh, sometimes quite different in, in different countries of the world. So since we have a very international um, group of students, um, I think some people are more familiar with sort of the history of the PhD in the United States than other people are. Um, and then I thought it would make sense to try to just walk through the thesis uh, writing process more or less chronologically, like where does it start, how, how does it uh, how does it develop? What what are the issues with uh, finding an advisor, working with advisors? What's a proposal? Proposal defense? The thesis? What's a thesis defense? How does all this interact with longer range career issues like the job market and um, stuff like that? So that's more or less the organization that I <coughs> that I envision. Um, if you go back, uh, so to start, with the question of the original contribution and what is the PhD and what is the conception of scholarship behind the PhD, if you go back to the late Middle Ages, um, when universities were first in Europe were first being um, founded, uh, the professor was typically uh, a guy with a book, okay, and this was this was not a book in our modern sense. This was his book, which he had written out by hand. Probably this book started when he was a student uh, and started taking notes, okay? And he also copied stuff from any book that he could get his hands on on his subject, uh, you know, of, that somebody else wrote. So what this book largely was, was a huge compendium of what other people thought. And that was highly prized as uh, scholarly knowledge. So a knowledgeable scholar was someone who had a very big book. And in fact, what, what lectures were largely about was that the students would come in, and there would be a little pot here on the table, and everybody would put their gilder or their uh, mark or whatever it was in, uh, in the in the little pot to get the right to sit in the class, and then they could open their book and start copying what the guy said. But then what he would do is open his book to such and such a page and start reading from it, you know, and that, that would go on for an hour, and that was a class, you know, and then this way scholarship um, reproduced 
reproducing itself. Now, <clears throat> in the 19th century, so this idea, this ideal of scholarship as uh, knowledge of what other people had said, have said, uh, was extremely influential um, and, and very important. It had a side effect that with a very few exceptions, such as Isaac Newton, some important, some important exceptions, such as Isaac Newton, um, most scientific research in the early modern period did not take place in the universities. Um, so Galileo, for example, was uh, not much of a, not really a professor at a university. Galileo really ran a research institute which was funded by whichever duke or whatever it was or municipality was willing to fund him most lavishly at any one moment, very much like modern research institutes in science. Um, and if you look at the other outstanding figures in early modern scientific research, you'll find much the same thing. They weren't attached to the university. So in the early 19th century, this came to kind of a head, particularly in Germany, because after the um, uh, Napoleonic Wars, uh, German, uh, there was a huge movement to um, rationalize and uh, modernize German institutions uh, in, in many, many dimensions. Um, one person who was quite important in this was actually our uh, well-known friend Hegel, who uh, played a big role in this uh, question. So the German, uh, in, in the discussion of how German education, and especially German higher education, ought to be uh, organized in the 19th century, um, there was a kind of rebellion or revolt against this model of knowledge as knowing what other people said. And the idea got into people's head that what scholarship should be about was original research or making an original contribution to knowledge, not repeating what other people had said, but in some dimension going beyond it. Um, in the United States, the first uh, PhD programs were at Johns Hopkins and at Harvard. And there was a real debate in the United States, this is something that you might want to look into a little bit, is the history of this, as to um, whether the US institutions would adopt what they called the German model, which was this model of original research being the core of a PhD, or the English model, which at that time still uh, was largely the model of, uh, of scholarly knowledge, of knowing what other people had said. Um, and uh, the decision was uh, made, and it, it's viewed as a quite faithful one, and it structured the way that American academia works, that American PhDs would be on the German model, so that the substance of the PhD would be um, a, uh, uh, an original piece, an original piece of research, which we think of as the PhD thesis. And this has a lot of consequences. Um, now, clearly, the U.S., uh, because you, you're in a U.S. graduate school, you know that there's an awful lot of U.S. education, Ph.D. level education, which is actually about what other people have said, right? I mean, all the coursework is basically about, uh, or a lot of the coursework is basically about that. Um, in the sciences, it's striking that that's much less true. In the sciences, people spend maybe a much shorter time on coursework. And what they read in coursework is much less a compendium of what other people have said. Uh, it's rather trying to learn specific techniques and ideas that bring people up to a certain level of competence. And their actual work as a graduate student is almost always in a lab where they are um, part of an ongoing, they're made part of an ongoing uh, research project, uh, which eventually leads to a, a dissertation. Um, so you know that there's a mixture and a spectrum, even in, in the US uh, system, uh, between these two uh, ideals. But 
uh, especially at the thesis level, uh, the notion that the key element of a thesis is an original contribution to knowledge is very important. And that uh, poses some psychological and intellectual problems for students, uh, not just students at the New School, because uh, every place I've taught, um, Columbia, Stanford, MIT, uh, graduate students have the same problem, that there's a big shifting of gears required between doing very well in coursework um, in, a, in a variety of dimensions and uh, doing the kind of research that's required for a thesis. Um, so what is an original contribution? Well, um, in some sense it's very easy to describe. Um, and, but what I'd like to emphasize is the continuity between original contribution as it's conceptualized for a PhD thesis and publishability in uh, scholarly journals, especially refereed scholarly journals. Because scholarly journals are not that interested in publishing uh, except for a particular class of article. Um, they're not that interested in publishing an article that doesn't have news value. What uh, the editor of a journal wants to see in an article is something new, something that his readers don't already know, or her readers don't already know. Um, and therefore, the, uh, if an editor of a journal is evaluating paper, typically the way they're going to do it is they're going to look at the abstract and look at the introduction, and they're going to say, if I believe that, that this was an impeccable work of science and scholarship as far as proving the things that, the, that are claimed in the abstract or the introduction, would I want to publish this paper? And the answer is very often no. Okay. Because there isn't anything interesting. The claims aren't interesting enough. The issues that are raised aren't important enough for the readership of the journal to spend time on, or for the editor of the journal to spend uh, pages on. Or the uh, contribution claimed is so marginal uh, of such a small um, increment that the, um, that the editor doesn't uh, feel that, uh, that it would be publishable, even if it was done as well as it would be possible to do that. So news value, something new. Uh, is very important. So you, you could summarize what you have to do either to write a scholarly, publishable scholarly article or to write a, um, a, a thesis chapter, a substantive thesis chapter, is just three things. One, you have to say something. Now, you might think that that's a ridiculous uh, point, but in fact, many people write stuff that's impossible for other people to read or understand. So by saying that you have to, I see Christian smiling here. <laughs> he's, he's been probably reading a few drafts. Um, so, one, so one dimension of this is, is, to, is to just write in a clear enough way and be able to explain what you're trying to say so that an ordinary human being, mortal human being, can actually understand it. It's not written for the mind of God. It's not written for Einstein, okay? It's not even written for your highly uh, esteemed thesis advisor and assumes that he, that person knows everything. Of course, the thesis advisor does know everything. But, <laughs> but you're not allowed to assume. So first of all, you have to write something. That, you have to say something. Secondly, preferably whatever you say has to be true or you have to have some evidence for it or some reason to believe it, okay? So you can't write just garbage. I mean, you, you, can, you, you can make claims that there's no reason for the reader to uh, believe. And the third is that it, there should be something new in it. So th that's very easy to describe, those three elements. It's not so easy sometimes to achieve, and especially maybe in the third, um, in the third point. So, as you're making the transition or changing gears, shifting gears from coursework to PhD thesis work, you have to make the adjustment, you have to make several adjustments in several dimensions. 
One is that a lot of coursework is asking you in papers and exams whether you understood a certain body of literature and a certain uh, reading list. Okay, and that's fine. That's part of the training, but that's definitely going to be secondary in a, in a thesis research or in writing a published article. It's not absent because part of uh, establishing the original contribution is explaining where the field or the problem that you're working on, what stage it's reached in the current literature, so that a reader can understand what it is new that you've added to it. So it's essential that there be some uh, introduction or some groundwork laid. It's also true that reviews of the literature, that is very substantial uh, surveys of a large part of the literature, are actually printed as uh, journal articles. They're called review articles. And there are some journals, like the Journal of Economic Literature, which primarily specialize in publishing those types of articles. So I'm not saying that's not a genre that's important. It, it can be a, a very important uh, genre. Uh, and it, I'm not saying that there's no place in a PhD thesis for a, uh, a survey in depth uh, like a review article. There often is one chapter. But what gets you the PhD is not that chapter. What gets you the PhD are uh, two or possibly three substantive chapters which uh, make a, uh, a definable contribution uh, to the knowledge of the problem uh, that you are working on. This also means that your relation to the faculty changes in a rather subtle way. In courses, you are put primarily in the position of doing what the instructor tells you to do, right? And finding out what the instructor wants and uh, meeting the instructor's expectations. And it's very natural to start the process of thesis research um, with the same idea in mind, that you're doing this as a paper for your advisor or a group of advisors or however that's set up. We'll talk about that a little bit uh, later. But there's actually, that's actually not quite right. And the reason for it is that the PhD is pass fail. The PhD is pass fail. The PhD is not graded. So what is it? <coughs> what are you trying to do here? You're not trying to get a grade. I mean, you presumably all know how to get grades because you're successful students and all that. But now it's, the issue is not getting paid from the instructor. Well, the, the way the instructor thinks about it, or the instructor is, is myself, is that what's an issue with the PhD uh, thesis is not what I necessarily think of it. It's what the world is going to think of it. So that we're thinking about whatever research, whatever contribution to knowledge is embodied in the PhD and whatever format it's embodied, that eventually it's going to have to see the light of day in publication, either in economics, almost always in part as journal articles. Occasionally people publish PhD theses as books. But normally, at least the first publication of new ideas is in the form of journal articles. So what I'm thinking about is not so much do I love it or do I hate it or do I think it's great or do I think it's not so great. I'm thinking uh, what kind of reception is this work going to get uh, on the part of a larger audience in the, in the big world out there, uh, which is closely related to what kind of reception is the student going to get on the job market. Um, and uh, particularly on whatever job market um, the student wants to aim for. Uh, so there's a real change in the meaning of the feedback that you're getting from the faculty. It's no longer this quasi-negotiation of what do I have to do to get an A minus or an A, you know, and 
trying to figure out from the faculty member just how much you have to do to do that, or in some cases, what's the absolute minimum that you have to do to do, to, to do that, or can you emotionally blackmail the instructor into letting that, uh, you know, waiver, letting the standards waiver something. Because now it's really kind of out of the out of the faculty members' control. Even if the if, even if I want to be a really nice guy, um, I'm not doing you any good if I let you get through with less uh, than with a with a less good piece of work than you than I think you are capable of doing. So the feedback is of a different kind. Is really of a different kind. And uh, this is sometimes very confusing uh, to students because they hear the feedback that they're getting from advisors and uh, thesis committees, uh, primarily in terms of this kind of negotiation. Now, sometimes there is a negotiation because sometimes the committee may think that certain parts of the work just don't meet the minimal standards. They don't meet the pass-fail standards. But that's really rather rare. Much more often, when you're getting close to a thesis defense, what the faculty are trying to do is to inspire uh, students to do better, to do, make the work as good as it can possibly uh, be. And uh, often, uh, at that stage, it becomes necessary to divide up um, comments into two categories. Here are some things that you have to do in order to get a defendable thesis out of this. Okay. The fact that your econometric method is completely inappropriate to the question that you're asking, that has to be fixed, okay? Because that's just not acceptable. Or there are comments that really have to do with where the work might go, how it might be developed as an eventual publication, uh, and, and the like. Um, and those things are much more open-ended, and they're not, they're not ultimata or uh, anything of that kind. It says you have to include uh, uh, China as a case uh, study in your thing. It might be, well, you've done really well on Brazil and Canada, but maybe it would be interesting if China were part of it, you know, or um, some notion. Um, establishing this kind of communication is, is a lot of what uh, the relationship between uh, advisors and thesis writing students is about. And I would suggest that if you ever feel that there is some uncertainty about that, that, you're, that you are a little in a fog about that and you're not sure what you're hearing, uh, it's totally appropriate to shift to a meta level and say, uh, what are you trying to tell to your advisor? What are you trying to tell me? What, what level should I take this comment at? I, I, it's a completely appropriate question and uh, uh, very sometimes clears the air immensely um, to, to do that. So you're thinking about a uh, uh, thesis topic. Um, if you're coming to me, I'm almost always going to ask you, what is your goal? What do you want to use the PhD for? And in what context? And then you may get a little huffy with me, because you may say, I'm, I'm a pure scholarly spirit. I don't want to talk about opportunistic stuff like the job market. I want to talk about the advancement of knowledge, right? But in, in fact, they're kind of connected. Because if you think about what I just said about a contribution to knowledge, a contribution to knowledge is not, a, is not really a completely abstract notion. A contribution to knowledge has to do with an intervention in the sociology of, um, of particular groups of people who are interested in particular kind of questions and problems. And what's a, an important contribution to knowledge to people who are working in NGOs or working in consulting firms, uh, trying to help uh, developing countries uh, 
get better central banking policy or better financial sector may be very different from what's um, a contribution to knowledge in the um, uh, academic, in, in say, primarily academic research environment. What's a contribution to knowledge for somebody who wants a job in an American university or college may not be exactly the same thing as what's the right contribution to knowledge for somebody who's going to planning to return to a job in South Asia or South America, even if it's an academic job. So uh, it's helpful to uh, have some sense of your priorities as you begin to formulate a uh, research topic. Another um, issue to think about in terms of formulating a research topic, I would strongly suggest that instead of thinking in terms of methods or general topics of interest, so I'm going to apply time series economics to uh, study uh, employment patterns uh, in advanced capitalist countries. Well, okay, I mean that sort of defines a, a topic area and it sort of defines one way to think about writing a paper. But maybe it's much better to think in terms of specific question that you want to answer. Why um, did uh, women survive the recent downturn in employment? Why did women's employment uh, survive the recent downturn much better than men's employment. I mean, that's a more specific uh, way of formulating a question. Um, so I would, in general, suggest always trying to return to formulating some specific question that, at least in principle, has an answer as the way to try to think about what you're trying to work on. Or, if you want to work, or think about a problem. What problem are you working on? Are we working on the problem of the fact that advanced capitalist countries uh, increasingly seem to have a contradiction between encouraging employment in traditional sectors like manufacturing and protecting their financial sector profitability or something of that kind? I mean, that's a problem. Or if you're just in methodology, which is challenging because methodology has worked over very heavily, so unless you have a really good idea about methodology, I would be cautious about it, um, then you may want to say, well, here's the problem. Um, uh, asymptotically unbiased estimators often are giving terrible results in, uh, with uh, limited uh, uh, data sets, especially the types of data sets that economists have. What, what can be done about that. That's at least a problem that there's a literature on and that you can um, try to formulate. I would say instead, this is just a, this is not true for everybody, but um, I think the most likely way that people make methodological uh, breakthroughs is in fact working on specific research questions, not working on the methodology directly itself. And if you look at the history of the way that this works, it's often that case. So somebody is um, trying to figure out uh, how to separate uh, saving from investment or identifying, which people at the New School tend to do, but I don't, I don't think it's it. And suddenly they realize that there is an instrument that nobody else has used, or a type of instrument that nobody else has used that would allow the identification of uh, that kind of that kind of metrics. Well, that's more likely to be the way that you're going to find something that really has some uh, long-run implications methodologically than if you go looking for it uh, directly in, in my view. So research questions, concrete research questions are important. So what, what are the characteristics of a good research question? Well, first of all, it has to be something that you are interested in. Because if you're not interested in it, you're not going to finish the thesis. Finishing a thesis is a very arduous uh, piece of life. And there are going to be low points, really low points along the way. 
And unless there's a little spark somewhere inside you that um, really is pushing you forward, you're just going to flame out at that point, and the thing will not get done. One of the corollaries of the fact that the thesis is pass-fail is that all, nobody ever fails the thesis. The way, the way the theses don't, what happens to theses that don't pass is that they don't get written. They never get written. And this is a large endemic problem, not just the New School, although the New School tends to have it for a variety of practical reasons that have to do with <clears throat> the low level of funding we have and the amount that, of time that people have to spend um, earning, uh, uh, earning money to sustain their studies. But it's a problem that's also an intellectual problem and a motivational problem. So a good research question is one that you're interested in. It catches your curiosity. It's something that you want to answer. Second, a good research question, at least in principle, should have an answer. And this is something that you don't have to wait six months or a year and a half until you finish a thesis to give some thought to. You can give some thought to what, are, what would possible answers to this research question be. Okay. And if you can't come up with any plausible and interesting possible answers, then maybe it's not such a great research question. If what happens is that a bunch of vague stuff comes into your mind that you can't uh, pin down very well, then maybe the research question either isn't formulated very well or maybe it is not uh, focused or, or directed um, very well. Third, it has to be feasible to do. And th this is where you're going to start uh, needing to have some discussions with advisors. So one question is going to be, has somebody else already done a lot on this? Now that in itself is not necessarily a bad thing, and, and a, a really important first step in approaching a research question is when you formulate a research question as well as you can, is to do a lot of reading of what's in the literature that's related to it. A lot of reading. Not just a little reading, a lot of reading. So that you really become kind of expert on that question. And um, now, you may find that a lot of the ideas that you have have already, in fact, been covered or worked out in publishing in published material. That in itself does not, is not fatal to a research question. Because in almost all cases, there's some more things that could be, uh, that could be investigated in an interesting question starting from what other people have already done, extending their models, extending their data sets, or uh, whatever the appropriate uh, research strategy uh, might be. But I think really uh, knowing what the story is on what's been done is, is quite uh, critical. It's very important that it be feasible also in, the, in a couple of other dimensions. If there has to be a method that could possibly answer the question. So one of the big problems with trying to decide whether saving determines investment or investment determines saving in advanced capitalist countries is that so far the mind of man has not, and woman has not um, come up with a methodology that can really uh, address that very crisply. I know the mind of Peter Fleischer, but <laughs> solved this problem. Um, Trouble is, Peter Flash has solved it in, I think, 14 different ways, so it's, uh, <laughs> which come up with rather different answers. But, but it's just an example that you want, to, you want to, at least in principle, feel like there's a method. Second, most methods, to settle many questions, you need some data. So you would like to know, does there exist any data which, given your method, is going to allow you to answer this question? One um, path to not writing a thesis that is very common at the new school is that somebody gets an interesting question, they have a method, they find out that there's no publicly available data set. So they say, well, my thesis work is going to be to collect the data necessary to answer this question. 
Well, in some cases, this is possible to do. If, if the scale of collection of the data is on the level of a survey or uh, something of that kind, people can do it. But there have been people who have spent seven or eight years of intensive research trying to uh, assemble data sets. Um, and I think that's a big mistake. I mean, I just think it's inappropriate. If, if the problem is at that level, it's the kind of question that really a big uh, statistic, a team of researchers who have some real resources, money, for example, uh, and research assistants and stuff like that, uh, they, that they might want to uh, tackle. But if you look at the, actually the scale of big data collection exercises, they're, they're enormous. And, and a, a single graduate student is not well uh, positioned to, to uh, make uh, a lot of progress on something like that. So this is not saying don't be ambitious or don't, don't try to break into new um, fields or, or new questions. But it does uh, mean to be somewhat self-protective and to think about the thing as a, uh, something that you can imagine yourself doing with the uh, resources that you have. How long does it take to write a thesis? I would say somewhere between one and two years, with an average of about 18 months, if you actually have the time to work in, in economics right now. Now, that's, I don't want to make that a universal hard and fast thing, but. Uh, really, it should not take you that long to write the equivalent of three journal articles. Sometime, take a look at Joe Stiglitz's CV. And just see, and just count for years, say, in the 1980s and early 1990s, how many research articles he was publishing a year. Okay? It does not take Joe Stiglitz very long to write an article. Now, you're, you're not Joseph. Are you sure it's a good idea that we look at this? <laughs> well, maybe you do. Well, the point being to, to get the whole thing under in, in some kind of perspective, which is that writing an article is, is something like uh, one or two a year is certainly a reasonable goal for ordinary human beings. And if you're having trouble imagining doing one or two a year, uh, then maybe you need to uh, do some thinking about the type of problem you're setting for yourself or the, the, the kind of work um, that you're doing. Typically, that is going to involve about six months, somewhere between six months or maybe up to a year, of actually identifying a research problem that you can work on and that you're interested in working on. It is during that time that you really need to talk to either an advisor or to several potential advisors about um, your ideas. Because they, that's when they can be of the most help to you. One of the biggest um, mistakes that I see people make is that they send me an email saying, I'm canceling my meeting with you because I didn't get anything done. I don't have anything to show you. Actually, I'm much more interested in seeing graduate students when they're stuck than I am in seeing them when they're doing something. Because if they're off there doing something, uh, great. And, but they don't really need me as a kind of cheerleader to keep them going around the track. But if they're stuck, then I want to have a discussion with them about just why they're stuck. Well, they're always sure that they're stuck because they're terrible people. And shouldn't have been in graduate school to begin with, and don't have the intellectual resources to write a thesis anyway. And, but actually, if you get behind some of these defensive rationalizations, um, typically people get stuck for um, other reasons which something can be done about. Either they've discovered a typical reason for getting stuck is that they discovered that the problem that they thought was so interesting really isn't so interesting to them. Maybe they found out something about it, and when they found out more about it, it got a lot less interesting. This, this is not uncommon. Well, that's okay. Then, then maybe it's time either to reformulate the problem, step back and ask why are we interested in this 
uh, field to begin with and so forth and uh, take another uh, crack at it. Sometimes they're stuck because they can't solve an equation. Or they solved the equation, but they made a mistake. And as a result of making a mistake in solving the equation, they have two incompatible answers, and they can't figure out what to do about it. Sometimes they're stuck because they don't understand the econometrics textbook. Sometimes they're stuck for, I mean, any one of a whole range of things that get you stuck. When that happens, you really do not want to hit your head against the brick wall. In, in real life, when people get stuck, they go to colleagues, they go uh, to um, senior people in the field, they go to editors, they go to anybody they can talk to, to try to get unstuck. So, um, did you want to come in? You're just, it's just distracting everybody in the audience. Oh, I didn't realize. Is this a job talk? Yes. Okay, sorry. Well, it's not a job no. talk. It's uh, orientation. Okay, sorry. I didn't about PhD writing. Um, yeah, sorry. Okay, so when you're stuck, is the good time to talk to somebody. Um, and I think during that first three, three month to six month period, it's very important to have really regular conversations, uh, intellectual conversations about what you're trying to do. In my view, in my model of the way that this works, the first thing that you write is not a proposal. The first thing you write is an article. Preferably an article that is uh, going either eventually or pretty soon to be submitted for publication. So your immediate goal, if, forget thesis, forget pages, forget all that kind of stuff. You just say to yourself, can I write an article that I could submit to a journal? That may involve identifying the journal, a particular journal that you might want to write for and um, stuff like this. This is connected with the researchable question because a researchable question ought to lead you to say, well, here's a paper that could be written about at least one aspect of that question that I could uh, send to a journal. In my experience, that is not easy to do. Uh, and that takes a while. It may take a lot of revision. It may take a lot of um, attempts to write the article and feedback from advisors. In this respect, I think the best model is to treat the advisors as if they were referees for, for a publication. So that, um, if possible, what you should try to give them is your best shot at a complete draft of an article in the right format and everything. So it has a title. It has a byline. This is a particular annoyance of mine, that I get a lot of things from students without their name on it. I thought that we went over this in first grade. You write your name in the upper right hand corner of the, of the paper. Or even better, you put by, you know, and put a little pride of authorship in there since you're now a professional. Um, but anyway, so, so it's got a title, it's got a byline, it's got an abstract, uh, it has an introduction, has a model, has uh, data analysis, it has discussion, it has citations, all of it is all put together the way the journal is. That's what you should really be aiming for as much as possible, even in, in pieces of work that you know aren't going to quite rise to that uh, level of submittability. But it's still a much better place to start because that's where you want to get eventually, and a, and a thesis advisor is going to be much more helpful to you. If, if, if you see something like, if I see something like that. Because I can say, all right, here's like a referee would do. Here's, you've got a good problem. Uh, you completely messed up the econometric analysis as far as I can tell, so you have to correct that. Uh, or you left out the key case, or there's this huge gap in your logic, or whatever it is that uh, uh, has to be fixed, and then you go. Then you go back, and you have something concrete to work on to fix. When you have a draft of a substantive piece of work at that level, that you and your advisor uh, doesn't necessarily ready to submit, but you think it's in pretty good shape. Okay, could be submitted. Maybe. 
That, in my view, is a good time to do a proposal and a proposal defense. Because in my um, experience, once a student has gotten through that first hurdle of writing a paper, as good a paper as he or she can do, then they don't need the advisor so much. Because they will have internalized, they, they now begin to see what these issues are and start to internalize uh, the uh, feedback process. And after all, if you stop and think about it, that has to be what the PhD writing is about. It has to be one of these needing the nest things, right? Where you start off needing an advisor, but at the end you don't need an advisor. Because you are an advisor, or you are a potential advisor. And that means that you've internalized, as far as your own work goes, at least a substantial part of what an advisor is supposed to be giving you. Um, and it also means that you have the confidence in a certain sense of what it is to do original research. So you, that transition is really, is really what it's about, in a way. That's, that's even more important, maybe, than the substantive research, is what it uh, means to so a proposal, in my view, is re rather short. It's maybe 12 pages or something like that. And it just consists of a short motivation for the work, a chapter outline, and the chapter that's already drafted is an appendix to it, so that the committee can read that chapter and it demonstrates the workability of the methods or the researchability of the question or whatever it might be. And then maybe you propose two other chapters. Maybe one is a, a literature review and another is a, a related paper or maybe a different paper that, the, uh, that your committee can understand. The importance of a proposal is that it is a kind of a contract between you and the committee. When the committee passes a proposal, it is saying to you, if you come up with something pretty much resembling what you described in this proposal, we will give you a PhD. And you are saying to the committee, I am not going to go away for two and a half years and come back with something completely different from this, which you may not like very much and demand that you pass me because I have a job offer uh, in Australia. So, so there's, there's, a two so there's two sides to, the, to this proposal contract. I also am a big believer in trying to get the proposal pretty close to the thesis defense, not having a really long time between the proposal defense and the thesis defense. Um, partly through those, through those reasons. 